Hello, and welcome to another episode of Science of the Southland. My name is Akshay Ishwaran, and joining me from the beautiful city of Atlanta, Georgia, is a man who loves spying on Cafe Intermezzo from across the street, Mr. Jake Grant. How are you tonight, sir? Uh, I can't complain. Uh, it's a cloudy day here in Atlanta, and we're recording much earlier than usual because of yeah. the... Uh, the uh, holiday shenanigans of the day. So, yes, we are recording this on Singles Awareness Day, as everyone knows. Um, I I also realized that I said tonight in the intro without realizing that it was approximately one a or one p.m. So that gives you a kind of uh, idea of how caffeinated I am today. You know, we're. Uh... We're doing our best. I got about half a mug of tea left, and and I think by the time I get to the bottom of that, we'll be in full swing in the podcast. So, yeah, I think so. Speaking of getting into the full swing of the podcast, we have, you know, quite a bit to talk about in terms of non rev updates. I say this every week, but I think the list keeps getting longer and longer as we keep adding spring sports and in, in season, and yeah. uh. Even this week, we, we added softball, we added track, and swim wraps uh, up its regular season. And I don't know. There's just a lot going on. It's, it's a lot different from I mean, even this time last year or, I mean, even this time like a couple months ago last year where there was just nothing. And that was a rough couple of weeks. It's, it's real weird looking at, um, looking at the schedule because I keep a big Excel with all the, like, dates of all the games for for teams and compared to having a football game a volleyball game or two maybe a cross-country meet in the fall it's like you know there's been more softball games in the last two days than there were games of all sports put together most weekends in the fall you know yeah and i mean that's podcasting is a visual medium of course so you can totally see me shrugging but um, you know, that's just kind of a result of the COVID schedule. I mean, it it stinks, especially in the fall where we were just like kind of living between or uh, living for the weekend and living for those football games. And but but now we have all of this media to consume. And I, it's, I tell my friends this, Akshay, uh, my swim club friends who are not quite as involved in the non-revenue world as we are. Um, diversify, like th- the amount of benefit I get from just like having more opportunities to get wins and not being wholly strung up on football games. It's kind of a freeing feeling, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think we're also in a different position. We've talked about this a couple of times. We're in a different position from even just a short couple of years ago where all of the programs were in the same sort of blah that football was. And that spring was was a little frustrating, but steadily, all of these programs have gotten better. The athletic department has gotten more effective and more uh, better as a whole. And you're starting to see that pay off, at least in terms of our mental health during the spring. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? And obviously, there's still heartbreakers, which will unpack Friday's basketball here in a second. Uh, unpack is one way to put it, yes. But – you know, there, there's bright spots too. Um, we're, we're, uh, I think it'd be smart to lead off with softball because that's where we kind of closed the show last week. And as we, as we record this, they haven't played their fifth game of the weekend yet. That'll be at one thirty today. Um, if you're listening to this and you want to see the results, go check them out. Ramblinrec.com, uh, Twitter or my piece, um, which will inevitably be recapping them <laughs> at some point later today when I get around to that. Um, but softball started four and zero. Hopefully, we make it five and zero today. And uh, I'd say there's a lot of good takeaways to have here. Yeah, uh, I have, as usual, started the timer because you didn't give me a minute to transition to that. But talking about softball, it they have started out electric. I know the schedule here, um, or, or at least this early sequence with the Buzz Classic, is not say the most competitive in terms of you know acc quality but we're talking about i I mean we're talking about radford who was uh um who has the i think it was the big south 
freshman of the year last year, I, I think. Um, and they also have been hot, you know, competitive in the Big South recently. They've made the NCAA tournament recently. Boise State isn't that much of a slouch either. We they held a scoreless for you know the most of the first game before the doors got blown off. So it's not an easy ride, but that doesn't mean it's a particularly or like a super super difficult ride either this weekend. Yeah, um, I know that they wrapped up the uh, buzz their buzz classic with a four zero loss to Boise State. Again, Bradford is. I mean, they're zero and five right now, probably for a decent reason. We we run ruled them twice yesterday, um, but I think hey, I was trying to give them credit. All right, I was going to say, uh, and I'm not going to hate on the program because those seniors on this team were recruited by our current head coach. So you know, you can't you can't throw shade at them. They're they're a pretty solid Big South program. Um, Eileen uh, Morales's big um, selling point when she got here, she really picked them up in the two years that she was there. Um, and I think, I don't know, we're, we're, it's been a little bit slower of a come up partially because of the pandemic and partially because, you know, you're in a, a deeper conference, a power five that is, you know, that there's more, there's more Louisville's and Florida States and Virginia techs in this conference. Uh, and less, I don't know, whatever else is in the big South, you know? Um, so I, I think we're, we saw the bones of, you know, the, I guess this is the fourth year of the, uh, Eileen Morales tenure. And I don't know, we got, we got pitching, we got hitting. I, what, what should we go into first year? I think we should start with the hitting. Cause I think that was the most fun part for me as someone who loves offense and any way, shape and form in all of the sports. Um, Cowden, Kalf, and I'm never going to say her last name, right? It's either Kalf or Kalf and Roper are arguably one of the like the best hitting trio I've seen at this program in a while. Obviously this is I'm saying this four games in and it's a it's a wildly hot take, but they were all gas no breaks in these first four games. Picking up Kennedy Cowden out of Kentucky. She transferred from Kentucky. What a get. She's a junior so she's got another another year um probably two because of um, pandemic baby. But like, it's not like she did that much at Kentucky. If you look at her bio on Ramblin rack, she was primarily a pinch runner and we've seen her. What does she have two home runs now? Three home runs. Either way. I mean the, the quote from Wiley on the broadcast this weekend was she hit all of her career home runs in this weekend. And I think she's had three, four of them, three of them. One of them was a grand slam. Either way, she she put in the work or something in the offseason because she is looking very solid. So uh, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, I think, the surprise of the weekend so far. I mean, she's looked solid enough in the offseason to merit a shuffling of that out uh, of that outfield. Right. Because we usually see Cameron Stanford in there. Um and a bunch of other rotational pieces, but she's now cemented herself as that center, in that center field role, um, which has merited a lot of shifting around of pieces on the board for Morales. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that speaks to us having a little bit more depth um, mm -hmm. than we've had in the past too, is that, you know, you, you play your way into playing time, right? And, and that's, that's the, the time old tale of how you, I don't know, find new parts. You can't, you're not going to get it if you never get in the game. And I think that's actually the really good part about starting with Boise, with Radford, with Georgia State, is we have this, you know, five games to play around with the puzzle pieces a little bit, see what works. Um, I mean, we saw Nelliman pitch twice, um, and we kind of have her staked out as a known known factor. But to get Bruce and Ray more more, you know, time in the circle, that helps too. And I mean, hopefully we're ready when, you know, ACC play starts in four days. Yeah. And it's a lot different from last year where you just sort of met the beast head on, right. By inviting Washington to come to your house and yep. I mean, what be Washington effectively. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, one of the best programs in the country. That it, I mean, obviously, we started a couple games um, that Friday before getting Washington, but still, I, yeah. I think I think the point that you were going for there still stands. Yeah, it's it's a you allow yourself to get tuned up before you get into the meat of that schedule, and I think, like you said, there's value in that. There, there's a lot of value in that, and that's what the Buzz Classic and then the Atlanta Challenge for baseball. Those are you know, the the primary meanings of those two, it's not that they aren't anti-competitive. It's that it gives everyone a chance that sort of lowish risk tune up. Um, obviously, that comes with a caveat of, you know, schedule stronger, et cetera, et cetera, which we give, you know, men's basketball a ton of crap for scheduling some of these teams early on in the season in the non-con. But I think this pros is and cons. Different, though, too, because like, you only have so many games and when you're for lack of a better way to put this, like they, you only have 10 non-con games and they can't all be against the Georgias and the Bamas and the Auburns of the world, or even like a Jacksonville state solid, you know, mid-major team. Um, you're you're going to play Kennesaw. You're going to play Georgia state. You're going to play Georgia. What that leaves you with what five games to fill. And you can't, you know, you, you have to have at least a couple games where you're feeling it out. So I don't see any issue with with them, you know, playing Radford, especially with our two games on Thursday being Florida State, which is, you know, obviously the conference favorite. So got to ramp up quick. It's, it's all you kind of kind of can do at this point. Yep. Um, and then for for the sake of clarity, and, and we've been alluding to it, uh, 18th, uh, we have Florida State twice, both games are on ACC Network uh, at 11 and 1.30 Friday, uh, 1 p.m. ACC Network, uh, Florida State again. And then we get the Clemson Tigers uh, in their first full season of existence. Um, they're already getting votes, so they're putting together something up there at least. Um, but Saturday, uh, Clemson. Um, Sunday, we get Clemson two times. So it's two three-game ACC series in four days. So lots of softball coming up again. There. Schedule congestion is yep. the name of the game, not only for softball, but also for women's basketball. How about that transition? Bam. You, you nailed it, which, which is weird. Cause last week we only saw women's basketball play once after, you know, that grind of having, I think it was four games in nine days or something like that. Um, where they were, it was, I think Miami uh, and then Syracuse, Clemson, Wake Forest. There's, it, it's a grind when you have to play that many times in that many days. I'm sure they appreciated only having one game this week, even if it was number one Louisville. Yeah, let's let's unpack that game a little bit. Uh, it was interesting. I don't know how much you caught. I tried to catch like a majority of it. I think I saw it about three quarters. And it seemed for the first half, like tech was able to keep pace. Like, I, I mean, they were, I think they were down by a couple points at half, but they were consistently able to keep pace and they were able to make baskets and put up a strong defensive front against a very attack minded Louisville team. And then what usually happens with Georgia tech basketball in both on both sides is that they just can't seem to make a basket for like, five minutes in the middle of the game and the other team completely takes over. And when you give Louisville an opening like that, they just sort of take it and run with it. And that's kind of what happened in this game, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the end, it was a 15 point game. Uh, not terrible for playing against the top five team on the road in probably the biggest crowd they'll see all year too. Um, but Louisville likes their four guard lineup. That kind of matches up interestingly with with how we play um, a center forward, three guards. Um, one big takeaway for me: Elizabeth Dixon had thirteen points. Elizabeth Balligan had nine. That's twenty two, and uh, obviously that output probably would have found its way into you know Dana Evans, Keanu Smith, uh, some of their other 
like very good players. Like there's a reason they're a top five team, but I am almost offended <laughs> yeah. that that the margin came from, you know, players that we used to talk up and, and have here, but you know, that's, that's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the, uh, the transfer life too. So that's the nature of having your, uh, programs coach, uh, have to leave and, very interesting circumstances, I think, is the best way I can put that. Yeah, and and I think the playing the two of them uh, and seeing them up play for a very good Louisville team um, when they were very good for us is um, it's going to be a reminder, and it's going to be a reminder until they graduate. But Georgia Tech is definitely on the ups. I think we played them tighter uh, than we generally have in the past. So I don't know. I'm not complaining. It, it, it was just one of those games where. You know, you, you spot them a six, eight point lead and it starts to get really hard to come back um, mm-hmm. one, once you're getting into a bit of a hole and not necessarily keeping exact pace with them. I think the thing with the, I think the thing with this game and sort of the thing with men's basketball, which we'll get to here in a minute, is that you can see you you saw a path to victory in this game, I think, which is the part that I'm I'm sort of stuck on. That first quarter where Tech, you know, led for big chunks of it, and then the second quarter where they were keeping pace, you saw sort of a model for moving forward and, and you know, finishing that game off. And then you hit the scoring drought, the typical, like, third quarter of scoring drought, and then it all falls apart. And, yeah, and they- I, I have said this before, and I've, we've said it a number of times with men's basketball, too. It's You can see the model. It's just sometimes ex- executing on that model. And, and to, to the women's basketball program's credit, they do it a lot better than, than the men. But it, it, you see the model. It's just sometimes, you know, they, they're young and in, in spots, and sometimes the execution is a, a little bit off. Yep, I feel that. Um, so I think we can transition over to the men's game, right? Because talking about execution being off and scoring droughts and uh, – <laughs> just a lot of a lot of dumb things that happened in that game versus Clemson. Do do you want to do you want to lead us off here? Ugh, I was in the middle of a yawn, but yes, um you know, the the men's team and they'll play tonight uh is currently in the midst of another one of those covid loaded schedule weeks. Um they had an emotional tough game against Virginia. Um that was close, led late et cetera, et cetera. Um, an emotional, close game against Clemson, led late, et cetera, et cetera. Both opportunities for quad one wins. Um, and, you know, they, in the end, it was a combination of, you know, possession, how they handled the ball, um, free throws, or lack of them in certain cases, because I'm pretty sure Tech got uh, – at least 50% less uh, free throws than the other team, or sorry, the other team got 50% more math is hard um, than tech. And when you don't go to the line as much and then don't capitalize when you're at the line, that makes it tough. Um, you know, it's, this team is almost unbeatable when Michael DeVoe and Jose Alvarado are both on, but it seems that that happening at the same time is a very rare occurrence of late. Mm-hmm. It should be mentioned that in both games they were in it until the very end. Like these are like we're talking. Like I just said with women, the women, the women's program. It's they're in these games late. They just have to execute. They have to finish the drill. We've been saying this all year. It's uh, honestly someone on Twitter said it best. This is year five of of passer. Like we we can excuse. Um, I, I think we can excuse. Uh, the not being able to finish a little bit easier for for a younger team. Like if this is year two or year year three, even we can say, hey, like they're still young, they're still trying to figure it out. But this is year five, and this is entirely Pastor's team. At so, some point, you have to turn the almosts into the wins. Yeah. And this year has been. We could very well be five or six wins better than we are right now. You could very well be at the near the top of the ACC, if not at the top. 
I, I haven't pulled the win probably like the post game win probability numbers for any of these. Like, but if I had to guess, you're looking at like yesterday versus Clemson at least fifty percent, or not yesterday. This was earlier this week versus Clemson at least fifty percent versus Virginia probably somewhere, uh, especially late on. You're looking at like sixty to seventy percent, et cetera, et cetera. You're looking at these close games being winnable games and games that maybe by the stats that you should have won and it's just not coming together and it's continually immensely frustrating that this does not come together for this team. And I just don't know where that leaves us moving forward as we look, because it, because the tournament is not going to happen. Like, I, I think we, we kind of have to make our peace with that. It's not, they have a slim to none chance. I would say, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, it, you got eight losses now where you, there's not a lot of, Places to pick up quad one wins, especially when you when you blow two in one week, you know? Yeah, and your only hope is to go, what, like six and one, including a win over Virginia Tech? Like, it, it's not looking too good for those chances. And so I don't know. I like I think the, the TLDR for this entire spiel that I'm making here is I don't know what, what comes after this. Like, I think it's going to be an interesting off season and that's the best way that I could put it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I really like Passner's development of a lot of his key players. Michael DeVoe perplexes me. I really like Passner's recruiting. Uh, some of his in-game decisions perplex me, you know, like it, it's, it's a team that has so many like positive trends and positive parts from what we've seen in the past and at the same time there's still just like little humps or big humps that they just can't get over you know and in a i mean in a longer season which i guess this is a normal size season but like eventually some of these things start to even out right like that's that's how statistics work some of these almost wins will turn into wins at some point but so, but they're what, like two and five or something stupid in single, not single possession, but like in these close games, like clearly something is not working. I think as soon as you have like a large enough sample size there, it's more something tactically or something strategically is not not working well rather than just statistics screwing with you. Yeah, I would agree. Um and that's kind of like, I don't know. I think we, it happens too much for it just to be like Murphy's Law, you know, yeah. like 50 coin flip. Like there has to be something systematic that is hurting us in close games. And I mean, you can, you can point to it. You can point to the turnovers. You can point to um, foul trouble like that. But it's, it, it would take some, I think it would take some deeper analysis and like, and, and, you know, coaching knowledge that both of us have. So we might just be out of our depth and looking for a cause here. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I'm not convinced that either of us are, like, obviously we know the sport, we know the game, we know this team, but we don't need to talk out of our butt and, and invent stuff. Um, we, we are not doctors. Probably. It is far yeah. be it from us to diagnose a condition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, credit where credit is due. Developing, especially Moses Wright, excellent. Mm -hmm. Just being in games and giving us hope. He's it's like, the hope that kills you, Jake. That's it's been better. The hope. Like, it, it's been hard. Yeah, not winning, not winning close games, but being in them and not being blown out and being able to feel that, like, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> there, there was. You can't tell me that this is worse than the well. 20, 20, 16, 17 had some had some great highlight wins, but there were some games like I, I distinctly recall Clemson Road game, Wake Forest Road game, where it was just never close, just a slog after the first like five minutes. Hell, even the the TCU uh, NIT final where we got down what like fifteen points in the first ten minutes of the game, like this team would not be like that, you know, like it's just not like that, and I think it makes the the lack of finishing or lack of follow through hard 
but I mean, it's better than what it was. I know that's not, it sounds like I'm damning him with faint praise, but I don't know. I don't know. I think you could say they fit nicely into Atlanta sports them personally. Yeah, that, that's fair. <laughs> it's it's all comfortably familiar. <sighs> you love to see it. Um, I really don't. We're not even going to joke about that. I really don't. <laughs> oh. Okay, it's fine. We're we're gonna we're gonna move on. We're gonna uh, sort of hammer out the last couple of things here. Men's tennis swept Georgia State. Any big big things to come out of that? And not really. It was too close for a while, but you know that it, it's it's Georgia State's Super Bowl basically every year, and they come in and they're super rowdy and and into it, and you know. You just got to get the dub. That is a, a team we are expected to beat and beat handily. And in the end, we did that. So no complaints. Bouncing around here, track. Nicole Fagan set another record. Yeah. Uh, don't sleep on Andrew Kent either. He is quite uh, quite good. So uh, Swim ended their regular season versus D2 Emmanuel College. Yeah. If anybody knows who or what an Emmanuel college is, let us know. Uh, Cause I had never heard of them until uh, today, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know. This one's a little bit disappointing because the Georgia tech invitational is usually held in the fall. And usually we see, I mean, we saw Alabama uh, and Auburn other points this year, but uh, in the past we've had a Florida team led by Caleb Dressel uh, for the non-swimmers. That that's probably a name you might recognize. Um, We've seen North Carolina, other ACC uh, solid programs. You know, it's it's just a little disappointing not to uh, to get that this year. But I guess that's the nature of the pandemic, too. So, oh, well, um, on to ACC's. Not really that many notable swims. Uh, Brooke Schweitzer did get a B cut in the 100 free. So uh, maybe she'll be able to follow that up and get her name kind of close to the running for, a, for an NCAA bid. Um, and other, other than that, it was just basically kind of shaking out as expected, mostly, um, last chance swims for, for kids not going to ACCs or maybe not, um, expected to final at ACCs. So fair enough. And then finally, women's tennis is in a bit of a slump, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say that, um, they're down 2-0 to number 15 Vanderbilt right now, but in terms of schedule difficulty, I think we have to giant asterisk that, yes, not even including this match, they are one and three in their last four matches, but that was against number five, Pepperdine, um, a top 10 Ohio State um, team. And, you know, we beat a top 10 Oklahoma State team, or maybe it's top 15. You know what I mean? Lost mm-hmm. to top five Georgia, might lose to top 15 Vandy. This is a absolute gauntlet of talent that they are being run through and outside of vicky flores and kenya jones it is all freshmen <laughs> you know like yeah it's freshmen and sophomores sorry but you know it's it's the youth showing itself i think it, it is sort of the uh takeaway from the, the last couple weeks it's the it's having like having young players with a lot of energy a lot of excitement a lot of talent is really good but in some of these situations when you have the gauntlet and you may not have the experience and depth, um, that sort of hurts you. And also they're playing with one hand, but uh, time behind their back or sort of uh, with uh, Ava Frastar not, uh, not available. So yep. uh, the squad rotation that they've had uh, given that has been, has been pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, interesting today too, that uh, Vandy put their, highest ranked singles player down on court three, um, kind of ducking our best, um, our best, you know, on court one or court two, which I don't know. It's tennis. You're, you're allowed to write your lineup however you want it, but definitely unconventional. Um, Gia Cohen uh, did, I believe just fall. So that might make it three Oh. And, and I, I think, the writing may be at least close to being on the wall for tennis. So not to, not to be too gloomy, but they are still a, if they are not ranked in the top 10, they'll still be a top 20 team. Like these are not, these are not slouch teams that they're losing to right now. So yes, it sucks. And yes, you want to see wins, but you know, with, with one of your top three singles players out with 
Uh, obviously, she plays doubles as well. And, you know, you're not going to win all these games. They're not, none of them are gimme games anyways. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you kind of got to, I don't know. I wish I could not hedge what I'm saying, but I feel like, all that was was just a giant hedge. So, <laughs> well, I think it's it's caveats. There are, there are a bunch of caveats to a lot of, you know, just when you have that tough of a schedule and when you're playing with that young of a roster, there's always going to be caveats in both directions. So, I am I'm fine with it, honestly. I think you like it. Obviously, like you said, it's disappointing, but they'll work it out. They'll even it out. Yep. Okay. Let's move on to another team that has a gauntlet of a schedule, the Georgia Tech baseball team. We're going to do our nice long preview of them with the time that we have remaining today, like we did with softball. So where would you like to start with this Georgia Tech baseball team in 2021? I don't think you can start discussing this team and not start in the bottom of the ninth uh, against Auburn in 2019. Because, quite frankly, I feel like that's still where my heart is at with this team. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a really frustrating place to be in, considering, you know, like like we never never really got to see the payoff, the follow-up the next year. Because, I mean, as soon as they started to click in, in 2020... It was just over. Mm-hmm. And, and just a short recap of those of those records. Obviously, the game that Jake is referring to in 2019 is the walk off is Auburn's walk off in the Atlanta Regional um, in 2019 in June, where Tech was the number three national seed. Um, they went 43 and 19, 19 and 11 in ACC, and then in 2020. Uh, before the pandemic, they went eleven and five, two and one in the ACC. Uh, I believe they were also finishing up a win versus Auburn uh, the day before the NBA locked it down, and thus the rest of the nation locked it down. So, a little bit of a uh, commonality there, if you if you think that way. Yep, um, the, Auburn is just up and down our our list there, but. Um... What was I going to say? Yes. Um, I think for as much as like, I feel in my heart that things are the, you know, like this is the continuation of the 2019 team. I don't honestly think that we can say that that's true. Really it really at all. You know, um, last year we had 16 games of, of the Danny Burrell tenure. So that is an important aspect of the staff. That's different. Um, Mm -hmm. there's a, new building and facility that's completely going to overhaul how we, you know, train, rehab, monitor, um, all that stuff uh, with players, uh, cutting edge in that sense. Plus, there's a lot of new faces. You know, this isn't as much as the the narrative strikes. Oh, yeah, this is this is just the, 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 the revenge tour or whatever for not ever you know, exercising those demons last year. Um, I don't think you can really say that, right? Because so much of this team is is new or or developed or or different. I mean, I would say the entire, almost the entire roster from that 2019 team has been turned over, right? A lot of the, a lot of that senior strength that Tech relied on in 2019 is, is in the minors. Yeah. They're, they're gone. They're good players, but they're gone. Like, yeah, you, you think about the rotation. Oh, Connor Thomas is the first person you think of. Oh, you think about uh, Friday starter, Xavier Curry. Yeah, he's been gone. So they've both been gone since 2019. McCann, English. Really, if you if you look back at it, we got about, you know, Andy Archer, um, Port Rodig still here, Luke Waddell. Brent Maybe. Herter is back from injury. So Will that's Height? We have one of the Will Heights still. Yeah, Austin Will Height is still on the roster. Yeah, but so it, it's a new you team. Still, it's a it's a brand new team, effectively. But you still have some of those pieces that know what that 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 have that you know that crushing feeling of getting walked off like that. And I think that's important. That sort of sets the tone for the season. 
it's you while you might say it's not a revenge tour i think there's still that motivation that senior leadership still remembers how how that season ended and that is an important part of setting the tone setting the culture for the season well if if you think about uh the acc tournament too after winning the division and basically waltzing through <laughs> waltzing through the tournament up to the championship game we kind of got pantsed at the end of got that pants by game. by unc yeah a, a team that we handled fairly solidly in, in the regular season um so yeah you can't you can't pin it all on the revenge tour and i i think the the most exciting thing for me and the exciting new thing is i cannot wait to watch parada Compton, Reed, Jenkins, we, we have some some great uh, talent that we've just been hearing about for so long, but we haven't really, like, you know, there there was, I guess there was White and Gold World Series in the fall, but it's not that like... That wasn't open to the public. Was, yeah, I was going to say, it's not like either of us were able to get in or anything like that. So, you know, it, it's it's a bunch of question marks, but man, are they shiny and, and bright and neon question marks, you know, like they're... They're definitely very intriguing. And I think you also have to point at another season of Burrell for being a boon for this team, right? Because they've, they've been able to train with him for almost probably like twice the amount of time that they had before, if not like twice or thrice, right? Yeah. So having that, uh, that pitching development especially um, might bear the same fruit that the hitting de- development of Ramsey did in 2019. Yeah. Um, and even then, I think that coupled with the facility, obviously they haven't been able to use the new facility all that much yet, considering it's still being polished off and, you know, batting cages are still outside, whatever. Having that for the season and then into the off season, I think is going to be massive for Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. Not <laughs> in terms of like, uh, like, rehab and, and working on your skills and, and getting better and, and analysis, which Burrell, wow. If you do not follow that man on Twitter, he knows his stuff. That is a good Twitter follow right there. But um, just in terms of what that draw means for future like talent classes, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about the, a program that has consistently put up top 10 recruiting classes and has continued that trend. But in like, just to sort of pivot, or like compare it to football, we we look at some of these programs that are near the top that always have top 10 recruiting classes and win recruiting championships, but they're never able to put it together during the season. So do these facilities close that gap for this team moving forward is sort of the question, right? Actually, you just came very dangerously close to calling Georgia Tech baseball the UGA football of college baseball and I'm I didn't say it I'm it. just saying I, I'm just saying where like you have to close that gap you have to win a regional make it to a super regional you have to exercise that demon how do you do it if are these are these facilities going to close the gap during the 2021 season I really really hope so I know it's stupid to predict too much and expect too much because every time you do that, you know, in some form or fashion, you're going to get let down, but man, let me tell you about getting let down with high expectations, Mr. Grant. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) And three, one leads and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, It, it's tough. You know, you can't really do any more than be a fan and hope like not, I don't know. You, a fan wearing a lucky Jersey is not going to change the outcome for these boys. Right. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. They put in the work, they have the pedigree and, and the, uh, as you say, recruiting trophies and all that stuff. So I guess we kind of just have to hope it, it shakes out. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to talking about some of the opponents on the schedule as we wait, as we know, work this out and wait for it to shake out. You have Louisville and NC State right off the bat, which is terrifying, legitimately terrifying, considering how highly rated those guys are by the coaches in the ACC. You Then you have Miami sort of on the back end, uh, who is the divisional favorite, the ACC divisional favorite. Um, how do you sort of see this playing out? I, 
obviously you're you're looking at a rebuilt a sort of rebuilt Miami team uh, who I know has lost I think a lot of their pitching staff don't really know what Louisville is going to look like uh, however you know people have been talking them up a lot NC State in the same boat how do you see these series playing out I think uh Probably more than Louisville, NC State is going to be a good barometer for this team. Um, the uh, I, I don't know. It, it's it's tough, much like we talked about with softball, to go from the all right, like warm up opening weekend. Like, it's not saying EKU is a warm up. Like they're they're a solid team. It, gr- honestly, great scheduling choice for that opening weekend when you couldn't do the Atlanta Challenge um, with bringing in three different teams from all over. Um, but, you know, you go straight from that to a legitimate Omaha contender year in and year out. I don't know how realistic it is to say, oh, yeah, we have to be 6-0 and after, after the first two, uh, two weekends, you know. But I mean, we're, we're also looking at Louisville as the one series that we did not finish off in 2019. I, I keep hating coming back to 2019, but that's – like you said, that's sort of the – it is kind of the revenge tour. It's the easiest. It's the it's the most data we have on this team because 2020 was sort of just a, a toss-up. It was a throwaway. So. And, and you, look at, you look at how 2019, the UGA three-game series went versus the 2020 three-game UGA series went versus 2021. And, and, yeah, those guys lost a lot in the last two years. I don't think they're going to be – A lot. I was lot, just, I don't think lot. they're going to be – terribly uh uh national contender types this year like they've been you know the last couple of years but like that's really the only byline we have between the, the two years other than virginia tech i guess because we that was the acc series we got in last year um so and maybe auburn because i think we get one against auburn this year this year mm-hmm. right i think it's at home um wow i said this year i too. have i but. Should be a better podcaster and have this in front of me. Let me let me double check. You you keep you keep rolling here. Um. So yeah, between between Auburn, NC, not NC State, uh, Virginia Tech, and UGA, those are the data points from 2020 that we're going to get any use out of. So I don't know. I'm not trying to kick the can away because like. Obviously, at some point, you have to like put down the measuring stick and, and know when and where um, you know your expectations lie. But I mean, the Louisville series is well, NC State's up first. Um, that's on the road. You got Louisville at home the weekend after that, and and in the middle you have a, a Georgia State um, and a Mercer weekday. Apart from the opening the opening weekend. I think by the time Louisville rolls into town, which it's my bad. I thought the two were flipped around, but by the time Louisville rolls into town, March 5th, 6th, 7th, I think that is, you know, we have them at home. We're a talented team. You have, you've had eight games to kind of, you know, get in the swing of it. That's got to be like a two in one weekend. Like they're good Mm -hmm. team, but I, I think we need to have the expectation of at least meatloafing that series. And also, you're at like I think it's understated how how much important being at home is, even with a twenty percent capacity crowd. Yeah, I think that still gives you an edge. Yeah, it it should. I mean, Georgia Tech baseball has a brand new like half third base line of the stadium. It's got you know some hype. I, I think we see with basketball what a little bit of spark and hype can do to completely change an environment. Um, again, biggest travesty about volleyball, um, this past year is the best team that we've had in a decade. Nobody could freaking watch them, you know? Um, it's a catch 22. It it is such a catch 22. And and you can't build the excitement for the program if people can't get in. If people think, oh, I can't get into baseball, they're not going to want to go, you know, like it, of, of all the years to have generally very good sporting success it's a bit of a travesty that they're all lining up to be the covid year you know yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> and there's not a lot to go with from that, but like we saw good student turnout last year in the couple games that we had at home. We, you know, it, it's it, it'd be a great a great celebration, and it's still going to be a great celebration to have the team playing to you know have a new stadium and all that. But I do think it'll be a little bit muted not to have you know a couple hundred students banging on the bleachers. But who knows? Yeah, you. I mean, you can hear the impact of that on. Uh, in McCamish and you could hear the uh, like Mike Bray of Notre Dame commented that commented on that in one of his post game press conferences. Um, you see a lot of, a lot of coaches and a lot of players actually sort of uncomfortable with the idea of opposing noise in a season where there hasn't been a lot of it. So it's, it'll be interesting. I think. Oh, it, Oh, that reminds me of something uncomfortable basketball. I think DeVoe at home versus on the road, McCamish is lit very weird compared to a lot of stadiums. Um, It's very dimly lit compared to some stadiums. That might play a factor into it, and I just now realized that um, that that might be a thing. Anyways, not to completely (laughs) distract from baseball, which we keep talking in circles kind of around our eventual conclusion there, but... Okay, yeah. let's 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 keep moving. Let's keep the let's keep making the sausage here. The expectations for the season, like the bare minimum here, I think is win the division, right? You have to win the division in order to declare that not even to declare the season a success, but not just a failure, I think. I I mean, I want to agree with you there, but Miami is going to be really good. This is probably Virginia's best team since they won it all um a couple of years ago. I don't know if that can be the only barometer for success because like, yes, winning the division means that you beat a bunch of good teams in the conference. Right. But like in the conference tournament, we saw when we won the division pretty nicely um, a few years back that that didn't translate into a conference title. Right. Mm -hmm. I would, I, I think I'd rather see us, you know, we get second in the division, whatever, uh, I would trade the division title for a tournament run, and I get that that's a little bit of an unrealistic, maybe thing to ask for. But I just don't know how much the division title means. Is what I think I'm trying to get at. I think my so for me when I was putting this together, I guess my understanding um, or my relation to this or, or, or frame of understanding was football, where you winning the division is sort of that metric of success for a lot of teams mm-hmm. I mean, where like, obviously like baseball's postseason structure is a lot is a is stranger and it's a lot less straightforward than football but that's where i was coming from with that i think but and, and i have in our notes here making a regional is sort of the expectation like the realistic expectation like yeah being in the tournament, being in the mix, is the is the realistic expectation. Yeah, I think it needs to be the realistic expectation too. Mm-hmm. And, and even as a stretch goal, maybe hosting again. You don't have to be the top three national seed like that happens once a blue mo- once in a blue moon. But you have to be top sixteen in the nation. The, this team is already starting out. What like nineteenth, twentieth in well, a lot of polls. I think this team is also underrated. Um, by polls, and 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 it's yeah. I can sit here at my desk and say, yeah, you underrated Georgia Tech, even though we haven't played a game yet. But I don't know. I think it's very clear that this team has a high floor, and that floor Mm -hmm. is would should with the amount of opportunities for quality wins that are on our schedule, playing in a good conference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is if, if we are not in a regional. That is an abject failure. Mm-hmm. With how much hype, with how much you know expectation, with how much talent, the regional is a must, and I I, I think we should probably be hosting. I, I I think it's it's an ex it should be an expectation for this program to host a regional. Okay, I mean I can I can jive with that. I was a uh, I was a little bit colder, but I can jive with it. I'm comfortable with that. I think, I think that's where we're we're flipped, right? You saw the division as the. This is the thing, and I definitely see not just make but host a regional as 
as the, the the meter stick, and we're allowed to have dissenting opinions, you know? Blasphemy. Everyone must have the same opinion about Georgia Tech sports all the time. <sighs> oh. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's talk, to, to round it off, let's talk about specific predictions. You go first, because I think yours is a little bit more interesting than mine, and I want to hear how you got there. Um. I kind of shot for the moon on this one, but I want to see uh, Parada on the All ACC first team. All right, well, I I need like has someone that probably should be doing a better job of keeping track of uh, all of ACC, you know, baseball recruiting and and talent levels and all that stuff. But you know, COVID and uh, you know all that stuff is a thing. What makes Parada so special that he can be in this position? Well. Clearly, other people are seeing that he's talented as well because he's been on several uh, all ACC, like freshman, rookie, et cetera, preseason first teams. Um, and I think that he is a, like I said with the, the team in general, he is a high floor player, right? He's toolsy, mm-hmm. but, you know, Georgia Tech has a great uh, reputation, deservedly so, of developing really good catchers. I mean, you can see that first and foremost uh, in Joey Bart, immediately followed by Kyle McCann. Um, and Jason Veritek in back in the day. Veritek, Dietrich, the, this, is, this is a good place to come and learn how to be a catcher. And I think that Danny Hall has shown that that, honestly, may be one of his greatest skills, um, or greatest positional um, focuses. And I think that's only going to get better as he actually gets live pitching, live hitting. Like we said, um, it's a specific prediction. This was the first one that popped into my head. I'm not saying it's an end all be all, but I don't know, man. I, I think he could be very good for, for three years on the flats. Okay. So let me, let me counter your prediction behind the plate with someone on the mound, right? I'm looking at Brant Herter to have an ERA under two for the season. Why he Brent was particular. That's my question. It, wait, what? Why Brent in particular? Why not pick Court Rodig? Why not pick Grissom? Why not pick Maxwell? What's so I think one of the one of the bad things about 2020, in addition to you know all of the disease, uh, was that we didn't get to see Herder come back from his injury and be effective. And he was he was very good during the first half of the season in 2019. He was, he was, I think he was leading the team in ERA despite starting on Sunday, which, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Sunday is typically the hardest starting spot, right? That's where you want to put your ace in. Yeah. So you saw, especially in 2019, we saw that p- the way that pitching went, Georgia Tech usually went. We didn't have that thir- a solid third-line starter in 2019, and especially as we got into – the latter stages of the season, sort of that that ACC championship game versus UNC, that uh, even the regional, you where a third line starter would have been useful to win yeah. to win the weekend and escape. You Tech didn't have that, and it struggled in those spots. Having Herder back healthy, I think one is symbolic of still having that senior leadership, that memory of 2019 and the struggle uh, at the end of that season, but also. You have a known quantity, a known talent. Obviously, he's had Tommy John, but you still know what he's capable of. And that helps you sort of – that helps inform your specific opinion of this team having a high floor. And if he's yeah. able to contribute at the same level as he was able to the first half of 2019 and, you know, even better with Burrell's help, I think that bodes very well for, for w- at least one game a weekend. Right. Never mind. Uh, the other two are the ones that you have to figure out the rotation for. But at least one game a weekend, you're locked in. You have a nailed on starter that is always going that is going to consistently get you innings. He's going to and he's going to get you a very low, nice ERA. I, uh, I would like to supplement that with a comment that just came through the from the Rumble Seat Slack, courtesy of one Mr. Kiefer Milligan. Um, he said, quote, have we achieved too many pitchers. <laughs> and and this is something <laughs> we had this in the shot sheet. This is the deepest bullpen and deepest pitching staff in years that I can think of. I think it's the deepest team uh, on the mound that I've 
ever seen since I started following tech baseball. Granted, that's five seasons, but you know, like if you would have told us in 2019, hey, so 2020 is going to be a weird year, but by 2021, you'll have dumped Howell as your pitching coach and replaced him with one of the most respected respected stat heads uh, <laughs> in the country. Um, you're going to have a brand new stadium. And uh, you're also going to have too many pitchers instead of not nearly enough. I think we've been like, okay, okay, one of those things is reasonable. We're not going to have all three. But, I mean, it just shows you how much time has changed, right? Mm -hmm. And I I do feel it necessary to clarify. It's not a new stadium. It is a renovated stadium, although it does have a new name. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. I mean, the whole third base line got knocked down and rebuilt. I think that's basically half a new stadium, right? It's not a new stadium unless it's been 25 years since the first renovation and the team moves out to the suburbs. We've been over this. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> okay. Any other any other baseball items before we wrap it up here? Um, Not that I can think of. Uh, season kicks off. Well, kicks off is a bad way to put it. But first you know. pitch. First pitch of the season's uh, 4 p.m. sharp on Friday uh, from Mac Knees Baseball Park uh, at Russ Chandler Stadium. However, it's you a say, clunky name. It's a clunky name. We're going to work through it. The Mick Rusty? I don't know. The yuck. That, I don't no, know. No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill that one right now. That No, we're not doing that. <laughs> okay. Well, well <laughs> we will see you, hopefully. I mean, I guess, hopefully, see you uh, at. The Rusty Sea this weekend. Uh, and listeners, we will uh, catch you soon. Thanks for listening. Oh,